Yeah, we live. Brilliant. Um, great. It's nice to be here. Another pizza session. Um, hi everyone who's with us today. Um, and we'll we'll start to get going. I'll give a bit of a rundown of who we are, why we're here, um, and then we'll get into today's session. So. Thanks again, everyone, for joining. I'm Max Lewis Clark. I'm here today with Spiros Muratis. Um, we're both from PA Consulting. Um, and for today's pizza session, we're going to talk about, and Spiros in particular is going to give a presentation on hidden Markov models uh, and Markov models. We're going to kick off the session with a bit of a Q&A chat about Spiros, uh, his career sort of as a data scientist. Um, but before leading into that, I'm going to just give a little bit of a uh, an update and a bit of housekeeping around what are the pizza sessions, why are we here today. Um, so what we do with these pizza sessions, uh, we run them every four to six weeks and the idea is a deeply technical data science forum um, that's focused on actual detailed discussion and breakdown of techniques, ideas, tools that we can, that we can play with. Um, and the leading principle really of all of this is about the data science community. Uh, so much great data science has come out of having active um, communities that ask questions, probe things, um, share ideas, and we really want to contribute to that and, and actually start to build a, uh, and grow that community ourselves. Um, so every four to six weeks we run these. They stream um, over YouTube. I know mean, we've got some of you watching today. Um, and our old sessions are all up on the YouTube channel as well, so you can catch and look back through those and some of the other topics we've gone through in the past. Um, and we also have a meetup network, so if you want to stay up to date on what might be coming next, then do join the meetup network, uh, it's where things often go out first. Um, and if you have any topics you'd like us to cover and actually run a session on and discuss, um, do just reach out and let us know, um, because it's great to have that sort of steer and again that community feeding back. Um, so with that sort of why are we here out the way, um, I think let's let's go into a little bit of a chat. Um, thanks Spiros for, for actually joining us today um, and bringing the sort of topic of hidden Markov models to the table. Um, I guess just to kick things off, I'll, I'll ask you to introduce yourselves and uh, introduce yourself and we'll have a chat from there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. <coughs> um, nice to be on the, one of the pizza sessions and nice to be on the Global Data Science Meetup for PA Consulting. So uh, my background, uh, educationally speaking, um, I studied uh, a Master of Engineering in um, Computer and Electrical Engineering, and then I did a, a Master of Science in, in Data Science, so essentially always uh, close to math and uh, engineering. Um, after that, I, I, I worked as a machine learning engineer and data scientist um, close to um, uh, for, for classical machine learning, not so much deep learning, and um, the data I was working uh, was usually customer customer facing data or uh, time series analysis data. And um, before I joined PA for a couple of years, I was working as a um, data science manager. I was leading a team of analysts and, and, and scientists for a wealth management firm. And then I joined I joined PA. I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> 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 and so the topic of today's discussion is hidden Markov models. Um, and my experience, I'm a mathematician, so if you talk about being close to maths, um, when I think of Markov models and Markov chains, I have vague memories of a long time ago, um, and stochastic processes and randomness and, and probability. Um, so how does the world of that that feels in my head very statistics heavy um, and, and theoretical feed into the world of data science, which is quite applied. Yeah, yeah, nice question, of course. Um, so, the as you said, the, the Markov models and the hidden Markov models are, are usually used for sequential modeling, yep. and um, the, uh, the statistical modeling for for sequences is m more powerful in a sense against the um, very new um, uh, machine learning models, deep learning models, in the sense that. It requires less data to train, and um, it requires less power and less time to, to train. So in a sense, it's a very good starting point if you ever have to solve a problem in sequence modeling where it can set a very high benchmark. Or actually, you can even use hidden Markov models in production if you want. You don't necessarily have to, to go further than that. But um, yeah, it, it sets a very high benchmark against more uh, stronger, if you like, machine learning uh, techniques. That's really interesting, and like the first thing that comes to my mind when I like I come across an application of statistics or data science I've not run into before is 
Well, what was your first encounter with them? How did you come across hidden Markov models and Markov modeling in this setting? I think like the, the majority of the uh, people who study master engineering, it's usually in university. It's the, you know, <laughs> going through linear algebra and, and statistics, uh, it will be one of the things that uh, you, you encounter for the first time. Um, and then I used them a bit more um, during my thesis, where I had to build a, um, a text classifier, a document classifier for law firm documents, just classify law documents based on the clauses in, in ter inside there. And I used hidden Markov models as one of my the models uh, to, to do that. Brilliant. That sounds really good. And it sort of adds up. I, I, I have a lot the same where it's coming into them early and then having that sort of when you get the freedom to actually investigate something on a slightly bigger scale, you find the interesting application for the theory that you've been learning all that time. Um, yeah, I mean, if you don't have to, to, to take an exam on the subject, it's def <laughs> it's def it's definitely, it's definitely easier to, to, to get involved on the subject, yeah. Brilliant. And so outside of the master's thesis and that university setting, um, and you're probably going to go into this in your presentation, um, what sort of applications uh, do you actually like sector-wise or industry-wise? Are there any particularly good ones for, for Markov models? Yeah, uh, I mean, as, as I said, you you use Markov models or hidden Markov models for uh, to model sequential data. So uh, sequential data can be, um, let's say, financial data. You can uh, model the situations that happens in the market, like bull market, bear market, neutral market. We will see a few examples later. Um, you can uh, model time series data, yeah. like uh, the data for the price of a stock in the stock market, or even um, you can model the natural language data. So the, la the, uh, the sentence we're saying now, it's ordered words in a sentence that have a certain meaning, and this is a sequence. So uh, hidden Markov models are also used to, to model uh, natural language. That's really interesting, and it, it, it sort of stands out to me that some of those examples were very sort of related to the financial sector, and you worked in wealth management, uh, and some are quite sort of different and more sort of abstract anywhere in terms of natural language processing. Yeah, I mean, it, also you have sequential data in biology, so it can be a lot of a lot of sectors that you uh, you can don't imagine the beginning that you can apply the hidden Markov models. Yeah, so I guess. Actually, back to the wealth management thing, um, you listed up a number of, of, of different roles, sort of that ML engineer, that team leader of a data science team, um, and now uh, a consultant, uh, specializing in data science, of course, it's a data <laughs> scientist and a consultant. Um, what's that transition been like, and how? what's your experience been in that new industry and setting? Yeah, I mean, so far, I'm still here, so it's very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, no, uh, I had a few friends uh, years ago who uh, used to work for, for PA. Actually, uh, they still work for one of them. Um, and they're always telling me about the cool projects they do in PA. They were telling me all about how many projects they do in a certain, like in a year, while I was maybe dealing with one project only. Yeah. They were saying all the um, uh, cool events PA has, like the Raspberry Pi competition, the, the yearly one. And um, I mean, I don't think I need more than that selling, <laughs> that selling points to, to join, right? And actually, since I joined, it's, it's true. They, we, in PA, I, I found that it's a consultancy which values the scientific process a lot and uh, in, in terms that we apply the scientific process to a client and um, uh, we will not just try to sell slides or we will not try to, to do a project if it's not feasible based on, on science. And yeah. I like that, I like that a lot. Uh, also, we, um, I found that the environment is very, very well rooted to uh, promote learning and then apply the learning to um, uh, a real life situation. And uh, yeah, it's, I'm, that's why I'm here. And again, if, if anyone would find that environment to be your kind of environment, feel free to come and join us. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do agree particularly on that point about uh, not just doing the learning, but finding the real life applications. Um, I, I agree with that and it, and it does make a bit of a difference. I find that quite stimulating. Um, great, well I will stop uh, taking up all our good time and, and starving the audience of, of the exciting presentation coming up. Um, so I'll hand over to Spiros now to actually get into the subject matter at hand. Um, what I want to say up front is just um, if you have any questions during the presentation, I'll be keeping an eye on the YouTube chat, I'll be keeping an eye on the hands in the room, um, and so do feel free, Like this is an open discussion, we're, we're all gonna be learning, but, but actually any questions are super welcome, um, and I'll flag Spiros down if need be. 
Um, so with that, over to you, Spurs. Perfect. Let's dive in. <laughs> so um, let me fix my pointer here. Perfect. <clears throat> so um, the content for today will be, um, we're going to start by looking uh, at hidden market model use cases for real life. Um, we're going to walk through the origin of market models, a bit of history, and then we'll explain the core of the market model, which is the market property. And in, uh, on parts four and five, we're going to dive to the market models and um, we're going to go from intuition to example to Python code. So let's start from the hidden Markov model, um, some, some real life use cases. The Markov models and hidden Markov models are used for sequence modeling. Sequence modeling can take a lot of forms based on the problem, problem in hand. Um, most of you might have heard the PageRank, which is the famous Google algorithm. Um, it works by counting the number of end quality of outgoing and uh, incoming links to a particular page in order to find out the importance of a page. Based on these two features, the current page is choosing the neighbor page to attach itself to. Um, a lesser but significant proportion, a, less, a lesser but significant proportion of the time, the user might abandon the current page and select a random page from the web to teleport to. And uh, uh, in order to account for that scenario, page and brain devise the, the dumping factor, um, which quantifies the likelihood that the web surfer abandons the current page and teleports to the new one. Now, um, because the user can teleport to any web page, each page has a chance of being picked by the um, nth page. So hidden Markov models, they are used to predict the probability of that teleportation. Um, another, another space where we're seeing sequential data is the financial markets and the stock market. Um, Markov models uh, here, and specifically hidden Markov models, are used to predict the volatility of the market and the price of stocks. Um, specific patterns, uh, as well as their estimated probability, can be discovered through the technical examination of historical data, as always in, in machine learning. Um, another couple of use cases that we see with hidden Markov models is natural language and, and sequencing biology. Um, the, um, <coughs> the thing, the, the thing that since the language is a, a sequence of words, in order to create the meaning and transfer information, Markov models can map the sequence and assign probabilities to future states based on the present state. Now, the Markov chain helps to build a system that when given an incomplete sentence, the system tries to predict the next word in the sentence. And um, this is similar to what you have in your keyboard when you try to predict, when you try to write a message and um, you have the prediction of the next word being given to you and you can choose it. Um, that happens because every word has a state um, or better, a hidden state from us. And um, usually it's a part of speech tag. And we can predict the next word based on the previous word, based on the previous state, which is essentially a word, but also a hidden state from us, which is a part of speech. We'll see that a bit later. <laughs> now, um, one question for you, and uh, you can feel free to drop it in the, uh, on the chat, is how do you think we could use more information when it comes to word prediction from the previous state? Currently, what we said is that the current state uses the previous state, which is the previous word, to predict the next one. Um, how can we add more information into that? <coughs> um, feel free to drop it in the chat, or I'll leave it later until we, when we see the, the hidden uh, Markov models. Now, um, another sector of uh, applications for the Markov models is the biological sequencing. Um, DNA uses um, A, T, G, and C nucleotides to communicate the genetic code through fractional sequences. Now, from the multiple sequence alignment, um, we can start computing the probability of transitioning uh, following the alignment we have seen previously. So, for example, here in the, in the diagram we have, um, we can begin calculating the probability of passing from the nucleotide A to G or from nucleotide T to T, for example. <coughs> and this has been four sectors from um, real life that where we will see uh, a lot of time um, hidden Markov models and Markov models being used. <laughs> now, um, we're going to go for and, and look the origins of Markov models and uh, a bit of history. <coughs> 
Now, the, the story starts with the weak law of large numbers. It was first uh, uh, Girolamo Cardano, or Girolamo Cardano, um, who observed but never proved the law of large numbers. And later it was uh, Bernoulli and Sebitsev um, created the proof uh, for the law of large number, each of them with a different way. Um, but let's look a bit what is the law, uh, the law of large numbers. Now, uh, a lot of you might have seen that before, so I will, I will try to keep it a bit short. So we have a, a distribution which is defined, finite, and um, with a certain variance and expected mean e of e of y equals mu. Um, we have independent variables from that distribution. <coughs> Sorry, we have independent variables from that distribution y1, y2, yn. And then we calculate the average, or else simple mean, um, xn, which is different from the true mean, uh, mu, which is the theoretical average. Um, the difference between them is that the, the theoretical mean is the average that we will have if we are able to continue our experiment um, infinite, in uh, infinite times. Um, while the expected mean, we have a finite set of variables. Now, by applying the um, Sebitev inequality, what we have at the end is that the probability that the sample mean falls away from the true mean, mu, by more than a fixed number, epsilon, is decreasing as n approaches infinity. In simple terms, the longer we continue the experiment, the difference between the sample and the expected mean goes to zero. And we can see the example here with the dice experiment. Um, in, the in the very beginning, when the dice rolls are very low in numbers, we can see the sample mean fluctuating around the expected mean, which is 3.5. But as we increase the number of dice rolls up to 1,000, then you can see that the um, sample mean is approaching the expected mean. And essentially, that was the weak law of large numbers. <laughs> now, <coughs> there was a, another mathematician. His name was uh, Pavel Nekrasov, and actually was a theologist turned mathematician who didn't like the idea of the predetermined ratios created from the law of large numbers. So he said that independence is the key for the weak law of large numbers to hold. Now, Markov, our, our hero today, um, was uh, interested in studying the extension of independent random sequences. And his main motivation uh, was that disagreement he had with, uh, Nekra with what Nekrasov said about the independence. So um, a Markov model uh, is a finite state machine with n distinct states and begin at time t equals 1 uh, in initial state. <coughs> it moves from the current state to the next one according to the transition probabilities associated with the current state. Um, and this kind of system is called a finite or discrete Markov model. Now, as we can see here for our state machine with a fair coin, we have two states which create four possible combinations. And the probability between each state is 0 0.5 every, everywhere. So essentially, we have a, a fair coin. Now, uh, and we'll see that later on uh, when we try to, to code that in Python, how it will work. Um, so essentially, Markov, based on that machine, uh, he ran a very long experiment. And at the end of the experiment, he saw that even with dependencies between the states, the mean of the sample uh, of the random variables uh, will actually, after enough experiments will be close to the expected mean. Um, and that's essentially how he started his, he started his work to, to Markov models and hidden Markov models, all from a disagreement. <laughs> so um, before we move further, we have to look the very core of the Markov models, which is the Markov property. And uh, uh, it's an essential ingredient and an essential assumption to continue with Markov models and hidden Markov models. <clears throat> what do we usually try to uh, achieve when we want to model a sequence? Um, let's say that we have a sequence which can be ordered list of values or, or symbols. The sequence is x1, x2, up to xt. Um, one of the questions we might usually ask is, what is the probability <coughs> of seeing a sequence here, uh, x1, x2, up to xt, given the sequence x1, x2, up to xt? Another question we might have is, um, around forecasting. What is the probability of seeing xt given the fact that we have seen already xt minus 1, xt minus 2, up to x1? 
Predicting, for example, the next word in a sentence is a, is a forecasting problem. So the mark of property, <coughs> sorry. So looking at the mark of property is um, a very restrictive assumption of the dependency structure of the joint probability distribution. Um, any future state, uh, x, xn plus one equals j, depends only on the present state, xn equals i. Um, in the, more, in the more generic equation here, given the fact that I am on the state i, what is the probability that I find my stand, my, my, my set myself on the state j? And um, as we've seen, uh, the Markov property says that anything before the current state, xn, it doesn't matter for the probability to, to exist. Now, um, <clears throat> if we go back and look at the experiment we, we had for the head and, and tails experiment, um, essentially, we say that the probability for um, heads given tails, it's equal to the probability of head given tails and any kind of sequence uh, of states before, um, the, before the tail state. It doesn't matter for us. And essentially, that's the, the Markov property, and that's how we're going to look at the Markov models from now on and the hidden Markov models mo moving forward in the presentation. <clears throat> now, why do we want to choose Markov property? Why don't we hold all the information from the, from the previous sequences? Um, in the fields of predictive modeling and probabilistic forecasting, the Markov property is considered desirable because it enables the understanding of the, pro of the resolution of a problem, but um, uh, that problem usually otherwise would be um, unsolvable, or if you like, it will be intractable. So intractability is when a problem can be solved in theory, but in real life would require a lot of resources, a lot of data, a lot of um, GPU or CPU um, resources to, to be solved. And um, having an example here, uh, consider that you are trying to apply a Markov model for the English language. Uh, we have two and a half, th two and a half thousand, three thousand words, which are describing 90% of the everyday English conversations. And let's say we try to model sentences of length 10, which is essentially a sequence. If we want our model to be able to predict the, the to get the probability for the 10th word based on the nine words that came before that one, then um, this is uh, 3,000 on the 10th and the power of 10th because we have 3,000 um, different words that can take um, its, in its state, right? Which not only it's very resource hungry, but we might not have even enough data to train all these possible combinations for, uh, for our vocabulary, for our problem. Um, so with the Markov property in mind and the fact that um, our next state is only uh, dependent on the, our current state, let's go and look at the, the Markov models. So we we have a sequence of categorical symbols that can be weather, part of speed stocks, they can be um, uh, like bull or bear market uh, situations in the financial market, like on the um, example on the bottom right. Um, we have a set of states, Q1, Q2, Q3, Qx. Uh, the process moves from uh, one state to another, generating a sequence of transitions, as you, see on the, as you can see on the example here. And um, it's Q, T uh, is observed at the discrete time, time step T. Um, now, the Markov property is satisfied for um, its Q. Uh, and as we said before, the Markov property is that, that our next state is only dependent on the current state and not on any state before that one. Um, since i and j can take a value from um, 1 to n, uh, there are n squared values that we have in total. And essentially, um, we can depict that with uh, a state transition matrix, A, I, J, which contains the potential, all the potential probabilities. It's easier for us, so we can do calculations and uh, multiplication between vectors and matrices. And for example, here for the, uh, for the Markov uh, diagram we have on the bottom right, we can see that the transition uh, matrix A is the, the one on the left. So for bull market, bull market, for example, we need 0.3. And for bull market, bear market, we need uh, 0 0.7 for the probability. Um, now, we also need, beside, beside the initial uh, transition matrix, we also need the, um, the, the starting matrix for our probabilities. Because uh, as you can see here, before Q0, 
there is nothing before that. We don't know what's the previous state. So usually the initial probabilities will be given to us in the form of the pi vector, uh, probability of um, Q1, as you see there, and it's a vector of size n. Now, you might ask, where do we get the, the vector usually? If we think on the machine learning context, um, usually we have a data set, and we will have the data to calculate the initial probabilities of the states based on the frequency of appearance in, in the data set, of the states in the data set. Um, so in, in also a similar way, we will calculate the state transition matrix A from the data when we have to split between training and, and test data. Now, let's try to look through um, a short uh, Markov model example. We have the um, state diagram on the uh, top right. We have the transition matrix probability on the uh, bottom right. Uh, two states, bull market, bear market, transition probabilities, uh, probability of bull market given bull market 0 0.3, uh, probability of bear market given bull market 0 0.7, etc. The initial probabilities, uh, probability of bull market 0 0.4, probability of bear market 0 0.6. So one question is, what's the probability of a sequence like we, we saw before, right? Mm -hmm. um, by, by, Markov chain pro by applying the Markov chain property, um, by, uh, the probability of the state sequence can be found from the, from the following formula. Now, it might, be, it might look a bit scary at the beginning, but if you think about it, we are applying the chain rule in the very beginning. Mm. Uh, so the probability of SI1, SI2, SIK equals to the probability of SIK given SIK minus 1, SIK minus 2 up to SI1, multiplied by the probability of uh, S, SIK minus 1 uh, down to SI1. But because we had before, we have a macro property, it means that on the first term, Anything before the SK, SIK minus 1, it doesn't matter. By continuing like that, we arrive on the final step, which is the probability of SIK is only dependent on the probability of SIK minus 1, SIK minus 1, SIK minus 2, all the way up to the initial probability, which is what we have from the previous, from the previous slide. So by knowing the transition probabilities between um, our states, and by knowing our initial probabilities, essentially, if we want to find the sequence of bear market, bear market, bull market, bull market, the only thing we have to do is apply the formula and then replace the numbers from our two vectors, from the initial vector pi and from the um, state transition matrix A. And that was, that was the simplest form of a, of a Markov model example. Um, so, before we move to the hidden Markov models, let's try to, to do a small recap. So we saw what a Markov model is and um, how are being used to model sequences, and we saw what the Markov property is and that assumption and how it's being used to um, create the essentially a Markov model. And we walked through a simple example of, of that. Um, but remember, the two main components also of the Markov model is the state transition matrix A and the initial state probability pi. Now let's dive to the hidden Markov models. So let's try to work our way to a hidden Markov model through an intuitive example. Um, imagine we are following um, a stock market trader in Twitter, and then the only input we have from them is the sentiment of their comments and posts, and we can understand if they are happy or sad at any point in time only from that. Now. Uh, these are the only two observable states we have. So what is that causes, though, the two observable states to happen in the first place? Of course, it's the state of the, of the financial markets. Um, imagine that um, we have three states in, the, in which financial markets can be at any point in time. It's a bull market, a bear market, or a neutral market. And we only have one state active at any point in time, in a similar way that we have only one observable state active at any point in time. Um, of course, our observable states are connected probabilistically to our three states of the market. And as we have seen before, there are also state transition probabilities between the states, the hidden states, if you like, uh, which are given to us from the state transition matrix A. Now, in this particular situation, then, we have an observable variable, 
which is the sad or happy trader. And then that, that situation, that observable variable, depends on the hidden stage of the market. And essentially, that's the intuition behind hidden Markov models. We observe a state which is dependent on a different set of states hidden from us. Um, and the observable state is affected probabilistically from these hidden states. Another example for hidden Markov models can be found uh, in genetics. So we are a good example. We are a manifestation of biological code. That code at some point um, wasn't able to be read uh, as it is today through to advancement of technology. Today we can read DNA code. But at the point in time where we're not able to read DNA code, we're using hidden Markov models to observe characteristics um, back and, and map these characteristics back to sequences of genetic code. Very real life example. <laughs> um, so another, let's try to go from a simple example to a real world example. Uh, it's still a bit, bit theoretical, but um, more close to us. So um, the, as we said before, the hidden Markov models and the Markov models can be used to model natural language. So um, here we have parts of speech, parts of speech tagging. Um, part of speech, they are categories in which work usually words belong to, and they tell us how words are being used in, in a sentence. We have um, eight main parts of speech that uh, you're able to see on the table here. Adjectives, adverbs, nouns, pronouns, uh, conjugations, verbs, etc. Um, the observable sequence is the sentence and the, the words we're, we're seeing, and the goal is to identify the part of speech for each of the words. And um, the language structure is the, the hidden state. Uh, the hidden state, if you like, is uh, what helps us communicate by giving meaning to the words we put together. And we usually we say that that hidden state is, is grammar. Um, for example, in the, uh, in the sentences below, I wrote this presentation yesterday, uh, Bill played the, the new video game. Both of these sentences are valid, both they have meaning, and we can understand what we're saying. But this is because there's an underlying hidden structure from us that um, gives this, these words a meaning. Now, we could say that we could write down all the laws that make up our grammar, and we, um, we could uh, put them together and try to, to instruct someone to, to give meaning to, to, to sentences based on that. But definitely, we cannot part of speech tags, put, part of, put part of speech tags to every single web page, let's say, in the web. Um, I mean, we could hire people to do that, but um, we can also use a hidden Markov model to, to do that to do that for us quite accurately, as we will see later. Now, before we move forward to a few examples, we need to look at the um, basic ingredients of hidden Markov models. Um, if you remember before, for Markov models, um, the main ingredients were the the states, were the Markov property. Um, we had the transition probability uh, metrics um, A, I, J, and then we have the uh, initial um, uh, probability vector pi. Now, um, let's try to look at the ingredients for the HMM. We have uh, two random uh, sequences, two, two sequences of random variables: um, x1, x2, xm, s1, s2, sm. Um, in in a, in a practical hidden Markov model, um, it's it's uh, xi corresponds to an observation, sad or happy, like we, we saw before, and um, it's uh, s of i corresponds to the state that generated the observation, is essentially the hidden state. And before we had bear market, bull market, neutral market. We also need the initial state distribution of the probability of being uh, in the state i when the sequence begins. And um, uh, this again given to us with pi i equals probability um, s1 equals i, similar to Markov models. Um, also, like Markov models, the uh, transition probability uh, matrix is still here a i j. And um, uh, in hidden Markov state, in hidden Markov models though, the states themselves are hidden. So the transition matrix a so was the probabilities of moving from one hidden state to another hidden state. The new variable here for us is the state transition matrix B. Um, if you remember the example before, we had uh, uh, arrows pointing from the hidden state to the situation, observable situations, mm -hmm. sad or happy. So 
essentially it shows us the probability of observing a symbol k when we're in the when we're in the state or hidden state j. A and again here it's um, a similar uh, matrix to a. It's a uh, it's a transition uh, probability matrix. Now, how can we? One question is how can we model the the joint distribution? Uh, pair xt equals xi, x1 uh, up to xm, um, and um, si equals s1, s2 up to sm. Um, similar to Markov models, um, the Markov property holds here, and that means that each of the subsequent states depends only on the, on the current state. Um, there is a new low assumption, uh, and that is that the observation only depends on the current state. And mm -hmm. as, as you remember before, it means that the observations that are happy, it will only depend on the current on the current in the state. Um, last but not least, in general, a hidden Markov model will be represented by that notation here. M equals the three comp the three main components of the hidden Markov model: um, a, b, and pi. And the joint distribution result will be given to us from that um, right part of the equation here. We we're not going to do the uh, we're not going to prove that here. But um, if you break it down to its components and apply the chain rule and accept the first um, Markov property and the second hidden Markov property assumption, you will be able to come up to to that result. Maybe exercise for home. Um, now we have three main problems that um, hidden Markov models usually are being used to, to, to answer. So um, uh, given a hidden Markov model, uh, again with the three components, A, B, and Pi, and the observable sequence O equals um, O1, O2, um, OX, the first problem we'll try to, to answer is um, to calculate the probability of observing the sequence O over all possible, all possible sequences. Um, for example, we could ask what is the probability that uh, we will see our trader being happy, happy and sad in that particular order. So we have to calculate the probability of that observable state over all possible sequences that we might have. Um, and when I'm saying sequences, it's over all possible sequences that our hidden states might have and affect our observable sequence. Right. Um, we have to remember the observable sequence is different from the from the state of the um, from the state from the sequence of the hidden state. So on the second problem, uh, which is an inverse problem, or else uh, the most likely sequence problem, again we have a hidden Markov model with our three components, and we have an observation sequence O O1, O2, OK. And we here we want to calculate the most likely sequence of hidden state SI that produced the observation sequence O. Um, as an example here, uh, take a part of speech tiger. Our hidden states are the parts of speech, um, and our, our observable variables are the words in the sentence. So given the words in the sentence, we're trying to find the most likely sequence of parts of speech tags which produce the sentence we're reading. Mm. Um, another example can be speech recognition. The words being spoken are the hidden states, and the audio signal are the observations. Um, the last problem um, is how we train a hidden Markov model. At, um, as, as with any model, we have to find the parameters by training the model with data, right? Uh, the, method we, the method by which we train the data is quite typical here. More or less, we will um, try to use maximum likelihood estimation. Uh, let's say, for example, we have a Gaussian here, and the task will be to find the variance, which is the virus and the mean, which are the main parameters of the Gaussian, uh, by fitting the data. And then, essentially, we can do that by setting up the likelihood function and then try to maximize that with respect to mu, mean, and um, sigma variance. And today, we're going to look mainly and focus on solving the uh, problem number two, which is inference, and essentially calculate the most likely sequence of hidden states that produce an observation. Um, Have we got a question from the room? Oh. 
is there only, if you go back to the previous slide, is there only one solution, uh, AB pi, for any given sequence? Uh, on, on the first problem or on the second problem? Um, any problem. So I if I have a sequence O, is there only one solution, a one model that fits that sequence? There is one. Uh, statistically speaking, there will be one maximum likely, likely yeah. Uh, when, it, for example, for the problem two, where we'll be looking to have the best fitted path from start to end um, in terms of um, ob the observation. Like again, if we have, um, let's say, happy, happy sad, there is only one optimal path of hidden states that will give us that particular icon uh, because only one path that will have the maximum, um, uh, the maximum. Uh, probability of being the, the, the output. Mm. Um, yeah, it um, in a certain degree it um, it can define local local optima if you like. As an extension of sorts to that question, um, we're all looking at these problems in the realm of given we've got our hidden Markov model. Um, are there any? Is there any sort of analysis or theory around uh, working across multiple uh, hidden Markov models? that are governing systems with the same states contained and then seeing how the, that changes the probability of the observation sequence uh, relating to different things um, or is that a case of you pick your hidden Markov model because these are what we truly believe are a b and pi because our observations are calculations so if i understood correctly um there will always be a training set a training data set yeah so you will have to give the model a training data set and as we'll see before you will create the Pi, um, A, and, and B, you will create the transition probability matrices and the initial probability matrices. And when you give the test data set, uh, because you know the hidden states, uh, essentially, it's you're not updating the model, if yeah. you like. Uh, th was, was that a so question? Around the tuning of those parameters of the model, is there any tuning sort of stuff done of, say, what A or, or say, pi, for example? We think, actually, maybe we got our pi's wrong. Um, but we, we could cut the data this way and come up to this conclusion. It's That's a very good question. I'm not, I'm not very sure about hyperparameter tuning, but I think I know you can have different ways of jumping from one uh, situation to another. Yeah. So by, for example, doing a random walk, uh, instead of following the actual, instead of following the actual uh, sequence of the uh, matrix probability of the probability state probability matrix, um, there are ways that you can. Um, jump from one sequence to another in a way to do it faster uh, and cheaper, essentially. No, that's, that's, that's yeah. really interesting. Um, a very good question. Um, so, let's, time to, let's try to, to look at a very simple hidden Markov uh, model <laughs> example. Simple, I promise. Um, <laughs> so, again, uh, our favorite diagram, bull market and bear market, our two observation states, uh, happy and sad. Um, we have our transition probabilities, we have our observation probabilities, and we have our initial probabilities down here. So we want to calculate uh, a probability of a sequence of observation, sad and happy. Um, in order to do that, we have to consider all possible hidden state sequences. So probability of sad and happy, uh, we can take that with probability of sad and happy given bull market and bull market and bull market. Probability of sudden happy uh, uh, with bear market and bull market. Probability of sudden happy with bear market and bear market. And probability of sudden happy with bull market and bear market. Mm. Um, we will try to analyze the first of the, the four terms here. And we are breaking down that also in the bottom right corner, um, which is the probability sudden happy, bull market, and bull market. Um, if you remember from a few slides before, we said that um, there is a probability of a seek of the hidden sequence, uh, sorry, of the observable sequence given the hidden sequence, which was that very confusing right part. Um, this is essentially what we're using here. Um, <coughs> and you can, maybe we can work that through the state diagram, right? In the beginning, um, we have the, uh, the observation of SAD, given the fact that we have a, a bull market, which is that term here. Um, we have the probability of being in the bull market as the first hidden state. We have the probability of the bull market given bull market, which is the middle arrow here. And then we have the probability of happy 
uh, given bull market, which is the last arrow here. And essentially, the first part says that we can observe sudden happy based on multiplying all these probabilities which give us the situation on the bottom right. And that was, that was the first, that was only the first term. Now, um, as we can see here, they trying to, so one thing to remember is that we have two states and we are asking a sequence of length two. If we have two states and we ask a sequence of length three, that grows exponentially, it will be two on the third, four, two on the fourth, etc. So it's a quite exhaustive process to compute every, every single combination um, uh, if we have a very long sequence, which we usually do have because we try to answer complicated pro problems like the, the, the genetic code sequencing, for example, right? So an algorithm that uh, can help us, an optimization algorithm that can help us solve that, but we will not necessarily discuss today, uh, it's called forward-backward algorithm. And uh, it's a dynamic programming algorithm and it is used for optimization. Um, practically speaking, um, what it's looking to, to do is to find common terms and computations like multiplications and additions, which are repeated between um, uh, the deployed uh, terms that you see here of the sum. Um, and then essentially it saves us resources and time from uh, computing the final output. Um, now, let's move on to the second problem. Um, as we saw, HMM, they can use for inference, uh, which is essentially the most likely sequence, sequence problem. Um, again, given uh, a three component in the Markov model and an observation sequence x1, x2, we calculate the most likely sequence. And, or else we can say that we want the sequence of states or of hidden states that best explains the observation x. Um, essentially, what we want is P of s um, uh, P of s, P of s given x, and um, we can see that here, which is a conditional probability distribution. It's the probability of hidden state s given the observation um, sequence x, and we want the maximum of this conditional probability distribution. Um, here, if we apply bias rule and reform the equation, it's equivalent of maximizing the joint distribution p, x, and s, divided by p of x. But as we've said before, p of x is independent of s, which means that any sort of change on the s has no effect on p of x, which is also means that um, p of x, we can say that differently, is constant with respect to, to s. So essentially, we can remove p of x from the equation just because we're trying to maximize the term. And um, it means that we're maximizing the p, uh, p of x s and x is equal of maximizing p s given x. Uh, now, in general, we have, um, we're given n states and t moments in time uh, and try to calculate all the possible hidden states that would take, uh, in general, too many resources. And that is equi equivalent to O uh, n, in the n on the t. Um, in order to spin, speed things up, again, we have to use an optimization algorithm. And um, in that particular case, that algorithm is called the Viterbi algorithm. Um, it's named after its inventor, which is called uh, Andrew Viterbi. He was an engineer and uh, also co-founder of Qualcomm. For all of you know, they, they produce, uh, they provide Apple with hardware. Um, so let's try to have a, an intuitive example of of the Terby algorithm before we, uh, before we go to its components and, and the maths behind it. Let's say you're trying to travel from London to, to Sydney, and um, if a lot of routes go from London to Brunei, it's, it's valid, I checked it on Scott Skarner. Um, if, if a lot of routes go from London to Brunei and from Brunei to Sydney, it doesn't make sense for you to join paths from London to Brunei with its path from, Lon from Brunei to, to Sydney natural thing to do would be to take the shortest path from London to Brunei and then the shortest path from Brunei to Sydney after. And that saves you time and resources from computing all the possible combinations between the, the, shortest, the two shortest paths. So if we try to look now back to our example from the slides before, um, we, if we expand the equation for all the possible cases for our given observable state, um, then 
and here, here, <coughs> sorry, and here we can use the uh, uh, transition matrix A and transition matrix B and the initial uh, probability matrix uh, matrix pi. We can see that there are a lot of common sequences which are calculated multiple times over and over again between the transition states. And again, you can imagine that these are all the same combination of paths that you would. Uh, calculate, for example, for one part from London to Brunei, right? Why to do it again and again? Um, and then essentially what the Viterbi algorithm will try to do is to avoid all these duplicates of multiplications and, uh, and, and calculations and try to save us time in a, and, and, and computing resources. Um, now, I think that might be one of the heavy slides of the presentation, but we'll go after that in a very um, uh, lengthy example, so uh, keep up with me. <laughs> um, so uh, as we said before, the Viterbi algorithm is similar to a forward back algorithm, and it's a dynamic programming optimization algorithm. Uh, so we're going to present the components, and then we go to the example. Now, um, for, for each transition, we need to consider how do we get to the next state, and how do we make the, the next observation. So the main question to ask here would be at time t what is the maximum probability given that i have already visited the optimal sequence prior to time t to arrive to state j again i will repeat that um, at time t what is the maximum probability given that i have already visited the optimal sequence of states prior to t i have arrived um, in state j now, we can define that as the delta t, t comma j. Um, uh, I have both equations here. One is with the transition probability matrices, and the other one is the, with the probabilities. Um, delta can be defined recursively, such that um, it searches through its previous state i to find the most, the most probable transition to state j. Um, and we can see that by going to uh, delta t minus 1 i and then looking through the best uh, probable transition from the transition matrix A and uh, the um, transition matri matrix B for observations. Uh, we will see exactly how that will work on the example after, step by step. Um, we also need, like before, in, in, order, in order to start our experiment, we need the um, uh, initialization step. Um, since there are no previous states uh, before the first step, then it is just the probability of arriving at state J multiplied with the observation coming from that, from that state. Um, now, we also need the termination step, and this is the maximum probability over the um, entire sequence. So delta at uh, state J at the time T capital uh, will give us a probability of arriving at state j at the final time t capital. Now, taking the max of that will give us the uh, entire probability for the sequence, for the whole sequence, which we'll uh, note that by uh, p star. Um, the transition state step is not the max, it's the arg max, which essentially will give us the argument that maximizes the probability for the whole sequence. And the reason we want that is because we want the actual sequence, the actual steps that of hidden states which guide us to the observable states. Uh, and last but not least, we have the variable psi, which help us with the backtracking. Um, as we said, both forward backward algorithm and Viterbi algorithm, they, are, um, they have usually two steps. One is the forward step and then the backtrack step. In the forward step, they will try to identify where they can save time, and then the backward step will do the calculations. Um, and what it tells us, what the side tells us is that uh, for the time t, what is the best possible previous state that takes us to the time to state j at time t? Um, so from that one, before we go to example, I would keep the delta, psi, and the initial probabilities. Now, let's see a very, <coughs> I would say, simple example. We have our two formulas here on the um, top left. We have our um, state transition matrix A, our uh, observation transition matrix B, and our initial uh, probabilities um, for A and B. 
Uh, the sequence we're looking to answer is um, what is the best sequence of hidden states that it will give us the observable sequence x, y, and y. Um, in this particular case, usually we have the delta at time zero uh, from the start um, hidden state b equals at one. And then w the only thing we have to do is take the formula and the formula and start applying the probabilities that we have already. So for the first one, um, we're looking for the delta at time step one for the hidden state A. Um, is the maximum of probability of A given the um, state hidden S O, which is uh, the start here, as we said before. Um, the probability of the um, uh, observable state S uh, asterisk S asterisk. Essentially, this doesn't exist for that particular state. Um, usually, it's one, but we take that because um, this this depiction of the problem solution is called trellis board, mm -hmm. and it's standard part of the initialization of trellis board. But uh, as you will see, that uh, is getting uh, a different notation later in the steps. Um, and then the last part is the delta zero of the state um, uh, S S O, uh, and that is uh, one, as we've seen from here. The uh, probability of A being at state um, S O that is uh, zero point seven. We get it from the starting. Uh, initialization matrix, and then the probability of the uh, asterisk s asterisk um, hidden state, uh, sorry, observable state based on the um, s zero hidden state is also one. Uh, so essentially, the only thing that matters is the starting probability for the uh, a here. Similar for b, um, and what we do is we have to save on the psi variable our um, uh, best. Uh, as of now, as uh, if you remember, is the maximum. So we're saving the uh, essentially the state here, uh, which is uh, the starting state as the best probability. Um, now, and of course, um, both A and B, uh, they have the red arrows back to start because this is only the only place that they can go as of now. Now, moving to uh, uh, T equals equals two, um, we have A and B. Uh, as we see, A can take can start from go back in two states, B and A. So we take first uh, A. We have probability of A uh, based on the um, S1, which is the previous hidden state, which would take that from the transition matrix. So it's 0 0.2, A, A for A. The next part is probability of observable state X uh, given on the state A, which is S1 here. So we take that from the uh, transition matrix B, 0 0.4. And the last part is delta 1 S1, which we take it from what we calculated before, which is 0 0.7. So this is the, the first option for the um, uh, A. The second option is to go back to state B. Uh, in order to see that is A for B, we take that from the transition probability matrix. Um, uh, a for <coughs> uh, X for B, we take that from uh, the observation matrix, and then the delta one of S one, we take that from the previous calculation. We have two two uh, different values. We take the max one, and this is our probability for delta two um, uh, of A. And we have to save our state, and at that point the state is B one. In a similar way, we work. Our B, we have our two values. Um, we keep the maximum one, and our psi B is equal to A one. And as you will see, next one, it means that our A has us as our best solution B. Uh, the B state has us our best solution A. Um, in a similar way, nothing nothing changes. We work our way through the third step for both A and B. And in that particular step, we have both A and B showing as the best state to be B. Um, we can see the output on the top right. Um, we have, of course, uh, notify, uh, we have also, um, noted the probabilities on the top of each state. And then we have the, the last state, which is the end state. The 0 0.1, again, it will come from the probability transition matrix here. Um, 
since there's um, there again there are, there are two options here since we have A and B we'll calculate them both the best possible solution is um, A uh, on the on the time four on the sorry on the uh, time step four um, and this will be our final result from um, the end state to A B A and the probability of that is equal to um, delta delta four and essentially what did we answer we answered that the probability of the hidden states A, B, A, given the fact that we observed end, sorry, end um, X, Y, Y, which is what we wanted to observe in the beginning, is equal with delta, delta 4. And this is how essentially we can, so in, the first, in the first pass we calculated everything and then in the second pass we found the, um, uh, the necessary output. Spiros, I yes. have a question from the chat, and thank you for that. I love, I'm going to pour back through this in slow mode because I love the visuals. They really help me piece together um, what's really quite complex. Um, it's a question from Jalal who asks, um, presuming AIJ and BJK matrices are fixed, because we've set them at the start, and I think this one's particularly in reference to the A matrix, which is always necessarily square. Um, they are, Jalal asks, could you explain why we can't utilize eigen decomposition um, and try and then simplify the ability to multiply these matrices? Um, I think it's probably one down to the complexity of how these matrices are being applied to each other and the probabilities. But um, if you've got any anything off the top of the head, why? <laughs> <laughs> it was a uh, eigen vector decomposition of 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 A and B to sort of um, then be able to simplify the calculation behind sequential matrix multiplications. I believe it's probably to do with the fact that maybe there aren't sequential mi matrix multiplications. Um, I would, yeah, nothing, nothing from the top of my head, I have to be honest here, uh, but anyone in the audience maybe with a background in heavy mathematics would like to join, no? <laughs> um, no, I, I, I wouldn't be on the situation now to, to know that, but definitely an interesting question. Um, never tried it before, uh, but keen to, to try and see how it will turn out. Yeah, my gut feeling is that diving into the theory, there'd be a complexity about why in the order of things matters um, and that you can't quite get around doing that. But I'd be intrigued as well to dig into it. So thank you for the question. Yeah, thank you for the question. Very good. Always nice to put us in a tight space. So, <laughs> very good. Um, so summary, we we saw real life examples for hidden Markov models. Um, we went through a bit of history of how Markov started to think about the Markov models and the Markov chain. Um, we walked through Markov property, the basic element of Markov models and Markov chain um, and hidden Markov chains. Um, and then we walked through uh, examples for Markov chains, hidden Markov uh, models, and then we saw the Viterbi of optimization algorithm. And as the next step, we'll try to go through uh, a bit of coding, uh, not something heavy, just to see how things would look like on the um, uh, on Python. <coughs> no, when I work, okay. Um, so, we were going to look through um, the uh, law of large numbers in the beginning just to see how, how things work in statistics and then we're going to look through the law of large numbers on the hidden Markov models, on the Markov models and then we're going to see um, hidden Markov models with parts of speed tagging, parts of speed tagging and uh, we're going to look at uh, uh, text um, uh, generation through Markov models. So. No, nothing, uh, uh, nothing, no, no, nothing out of the ordinary when it comes to uh, the libraries we need to to load. Um, let's try to look at the <coughs> first one, which is the weak law of large numbers. Essentially, we have um, uh, a head and tail uh, fair coin here. Um, we are going to execute five experiments through ten, a hundred, um, thousand, and ten thousand iterations. And we're going to see how the uh, probability of heads fluctuates um, with its duration. Sorry, with this experiment. Um, 
as expected in the very beginning, the probability, for example, for heads, it's uh, very far away from the mean. It fluctuates a lot. Uh, the more, sorry, you zoom in. Oh, so, yes. Yes. <coughs> on the on the first part, the uh, on the first experiment with only ten flips, the uh, the probability, the mean for the sorry, the probability for heads fluctuates a lot between the experiments, but. As we move down to um, thousand, and it's running for ten thousand, uh, perfect. As we move around to the ten thousand um, uh, flips, we can see that the uh, probability for heads is um, very close to the expected probability of heads for the for the experiment. And essentially, that's the one way to look on the weak law of large numbers. Now, if we go and see what Markov tried to do and how he tried to disprove the Kazov. He took um, uh, a few states like we have here, bull market, bear market, future market, and he set up a dependency transition probability matrix between them, as we see here. And everything after that is the same, uh, except the fact that the random choice now is between one of the three states, but it's coming based on the transition probability matrix. So if we run again an experiment for different iterations, we can see that in the beginning, um, the bull market, bear market, and neutral market probabilities might fluctuate a bit between 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Uh, neutral market, for example, on the 100 iteration is le less than 0 0.2. The more we increase the um, repetitions, um, in the last two, 10,000 and uh, 100,000, everything stabilizes around the expected, the expected value of the probabilities that its, its state has. And essentially, that was the, the idea behind Markov proving that, you know what, no, dependencies, depending probabilities and dependent states, sorry, depending states also um, abide by the uh, weak law of large numbers. Now, on the first, a bit more interesting um, uh, piece of code, which is the Markov models for um, <coughs> text generation, we are going to load um, uh, different stories from um, uh, for Sherlock Holmes. Uh, they are coming from um, Kaggle, that particular data set. The stories will um, look uh, something like that in a in a list. Um, we're going to clean the text by making everything lowercase, removing punctuation, tokenizing, because essentially we want to go down to words since each mm -hmm. word is a state. And our clean stories will um, will look something like that. Works in a list. Yes. <coughs> We're still running. Um, anyone maybe has any answer for the uh, question? How can we get more information when it comes to words? Uh, and instead of looking only to one word with a previous state, uh, we can actually get a bit more more context. In the chat. I believe there was one, one answer in the chat, which was n-grams. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, that's the question. Um, instead of having each separate wall, like for example, there, we can have um, two uh, n-grams of, of um, length two would be the Gloria or yeah, the Gloria squad. Mm. Good. And um, essentially here, we're going to create the, the our Markov model in that function. Um, it's going to be uh, a dictionary or even better, um, uh, an em embedded dictionary uh, because we need for its word to keep the um, all, all the possible uh, previous states uh, and their probabilities um, and essentially what we're doing here it will be an n-gram of 2 like we said because it will give us a bit better context um, if the current state um, uh, oh, sorry we're going through the a loop of the n-gram um, and try to compute the uh, the previous the previous two states um, the sorry, the current state and the next state. Um, if the if the state is already in the <coughs> if the state is already inside the dictionary, we are not going to duplicate it. We're just going to add the next state to the existing um, current state. Um, and then at the very end, we're we're calculating the transition probabilities by um, uh, uh, by the division of the frequency. Essentially, we're finding uh, for the for the states inside the. Um <coughs> Uh, inside the uh, word dictionary, if you like. Um, by applying that to um, our clean stories uh, list, um, we can see 
how uh, an example could look like for a particular state. Uh, for example, the the biogram, the, the game, this is what it looked like uh, when it comes to the next state and the probability. And this is again essentially the transition probability matrix A when it comes to uh, to our presentation before. Now, if we try to generate a, a story, um, let's do it by giving it DR Holmes and a limit of eight eight biograms. And essentially, this is this is the this is the output. Uh, if you go if you go through them, you will see that there is they can make sense at some point, but at some point the the, the meaning will break down because of course it's not the smartest thing. <laughs> <laughs> but still, it's what we said before, it's very easy to experiment very fast without having to yeah. train a model for hours and hours. Um, the last part is the um, hidden Markov models and parts of piece tagging. Um, we're going to load um, a dataset from an LTK library. The concept is more or less the same. We'll use the data to split the data between training and tests. We're trying to calculate the um, transition probability matrix A and observation probability matrix B and the initial probability uh, vector pi. And then we will try to, uh, based on the train, trained data set with parts of speech, we'll try to predict the part, part of speech for the test, for the test data set. Um, but the, the te <coughs> sorry. We are splitting between uh, uh, train and test uh, on the 80-20 uh, rule. Um, the, train te the train data set will look um, uh, like that with a word and the part of speeds. Um, it's something that we want to um, change to a list. It's easier for us to utilize uh, later. Um, just for the sake of us knowing how many part of speech we have here, it's noun, um, adjective, adverb, conjugation, a um, uh, few of the yeah, verb, and we have also x and the dot. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, uh, the dot actually it's one of the. In, if we don't have any any part of speech, the dot is being used as the initial initial um, uh, part, initial state, uh, and we are computing like that. Our um, initial probability is vector pi. So the emission probabilities uh, uh, in this function that we'll use later, um, essentially we're, we're taking the trained um, data set, we're taking the, uh, the word and the tag that will be given to us later um, uh, in the code, and we try to go through the list of tags, count how many, how many times we find um, that word with the, that particular tag, and then um, uh, what we turn at the end, uh, it's the uh, the count of the tag plus the count of tag in total, so we are able to understand how that word is uh, um, related to, sorry, how that um, state is related um, probabilistically to the, to the rest of the states. Um, for the uh, transition probability, um, uh, for the transition probability matrix, um, it's not very different from the one we saw in the Markov models. Um, we have again the, the training um, data set and um, uh, it's essentially a matrix of um, um, T, as we said, it's a, it's a, a square matrix, right? Um, and uh, we're counting, we're giving it to, um, to the, we're giving to the, um, <coughs> uh, sorry, we're giving to, uh, to the function um, the, the words that we're going to count inside the training data set and then we're going to divide them by the, the, the we're going to divide their frequency by the total number and at the end we're getting the transition probability for them. Um, so what will, how the transition probability metrics will look at the end is like that. It's a data set, uh, it's a data frame where we can see um, the transition probabilities between the hidden states, mm. which, as we said before, the hidden states are the part of speeds. Um, and then we're coming to the Viterbi algorithm. So here we, <coughs> questions in the chat. <laughs> uh, uh, we're coming to the Viterbi algorithm. Uh, here we're given again the awards that uh, we're gonna test against the, um, the trained data set. 
um, we're looking for the um, existing states, which in the beginning are zero. Um, we're taking the um, uh, the necessary tags, uh, and then essentially we're initializing the probabilities for its given observation, which is a word. Um, we are looking through the tags. Um, if that never existed before, it, we're giving the initial tag. If um, uh, that transition probability existed before, then we'll try to calculate the probability for the next for the, uh, for the previous tag. Um, we're computing the emission and stage probability for a particular new word, which is again from the test data set. It doesn't have anything tagged on it. Uh, it's just a word. Um, and uh, here's the computation that we saw for the emission and transition probabilities. Um, we are appending our output to the um, list of probabilities, and then we have to choose the max one before we go outside from the inner loop to the, to the bigger loop, which is the, the next word. Um, we are appending, of course, the, um, the states uh, for, that for that particular word into um, the state list in the beginning. And then at the very end, we're turning back one word connected to one state only. Um, if we try an example uh, for 10 words, um, it will, oh, hmm, that's interesting. Uh, just why not to have a problem in the live demo? <laughs> uh, no, it will take around um, 40, 50 seconds to run, but uh, eventually it will show us how um, the initial tags that we have from the test uh, data set, they match against the predicted tags that we, get, we got from the um, uh, Viterbi algorithm. Brilliant. Whilst we're waiting for that to run, it might be a good time for me to broach the other question we got from the yes. chat. Please, if I can answer the time. So um, we got another quick question from Jalal, um, who, and, and I think this gets a really interesting um, interaction, right, which is between the hidden Markov chains going on and the hidden states and the visible states that we're observing. Um, and I think it comes back to that set of three, three examples of what you might be able to do with, with this machinery. Um, questions around, are there any examples of Markov models or use of Markov models that attempts to model a sequence of the observer states simultaneously with the hidden states and the interaction between them. So the example is creating something like an understanding of the change in observer state without the hidden state. Um, so like, yeah. Versus, yeah. Um, again, it's um, I haven't I haven't implemented that. It's from the you know, um, uh, documentation I've read before and uh, uh, my my personal research on the issue. Um, you can put together multiple states like we did the words here and then essentially you're expanding your um, you're expanding your states your one state to include multiple states uh, and that's the to my knowledge the only way that you can have multiple states at the same time being being discovered against the hidden states and your hidden states can be the same thing you can have mapped you can group together multiple hidden states as one hidden state. Um, but depending on the problem in hand, or you might actually missing or giving more information or less information to your model. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks for the question. So the yeah, our algorithm run um, and yeah, the accuracy here is is ninety five percent. Again, it's not. I wouldn't say it's the most sophisticated, of course, way to measure that. But at the very end, we're um, comparing how many. Uh, the accuracy here means that uh, how many of the tags from the from the test data set actually matching against the tags. Uh, part of these tags from the from the training deficit. Right, five percent, pretty good. Yeah, and that was hidden Markov models from uh, intuition theory to to code. Hope you enjoyed it. Brilliant. We over. Great. <laughs> so thanks everyone who joined in person and on the call. A big thank you to Spiros for taking us through all that. Um, as I said before, I, I, I come from a mathsy background. I love stuff you can look at as well. I really want to start coding away at this and steal some of your code. Um, uh, but yeah, big thank you for everyone who, who has joined. I think, again, this is a 
community sort of initiative it's about building that data science community um, and so if you have any comments feedback ideas on what you might want to see in the future do reach out to us um, because I, I think that is a big step in what we want to do um, so that's all from today um, I think our next one is as of yet unplanned September. but it will be in September um, until then we'll see you soon uh, <laughs> cheers <laughs>